All right. Sorry, everyone, for the technical difficulties. Um, my laptop didn't want to communicate with the projector, so we had to uh, come up with an alternate plan. Um, so we're going to jump into things really quickly because we're already short on time. Uh, my name is Aaron Bishop. I'm a principal penetration tester at Security Metrics. Um, I've been involved in the security field for about 10 years. Got my start doing IT and sysadmin work, um, taking care of databases, web servers, mail servers, um, telephony servers, all sorts of fun stuff. And then over the years, I moved away from fixing things to breaking things. I spent this past six years as a penetration tester. Today, we're going to be talking about cross-site request forgery, also known as CSERF. For the rest of the presentation, I'll refer to it as CSERF because it's a lot easier to say than cross-site request forgery. So moving right along, what is CSERF? Uh, OWASP defines CSERF as it's an attack that forces an end user to execute unwanted actions on a web application. Now, a lot of people, they look at the definitions from OWASP and the things they put up, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, for me, I've simplified CSERF down to just we're going to trick a user into doing something they didn't intend to do. And so for the rest of our presentation here, uh, we're going to follow our friend Bob throughout his normal daily actions. Now, I would have a nice presentation with different tabs and wind or different windows and stuff, but we don't have that luxury right now. So we're going to do it in here. All right, so this is our friend Bob. And so Bob, um, we'll say this is his company's website. He comes and he logs into it every day, um, goes about his work, and he uses it when he goes off to, to go to lunch or something. He updates his name to display that he's out at work or out at lunch. So now everybody knows Bob's gone um, for the day or he's away from his desk, not doing any work. We went to lunch, and so Bob uses his time at lunch to visit his favorite site that hosts some of his favorite videos online. So Bob goes, visits his favorite site, gets to watch his pink fluffy unicorns dancing on the rainbow. And when Bob comes back to view his page, I think the browser blocked the attack. Hey, <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> so we can actually check and see if that's what happened here. Let's see. Yeah, all right. So browsers do have built-in um, CSERF protection in some cases in the sense that um, this request is trying to go to a different domain. Um, so your browser blocked that. So with that being the case, a lot of these demonstrations aren't actually going to work. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if Firefox is on here. We'll see if Firefox has it. That's right, we changed Bob's username. Right. See if Firefox prevent it. 
And it did. Awesome. All right. Well, the demo gods are not happy with me today. So <laughs> that is an option. Um, luckily, I kind of doc or I documented everything that's supposed to happen. And I didn't verify it would happen on those particular browsers. Probably should have, but I didn't. So what would have happened and what you would have seen there is Bob would log into let's say his company site, csurf.vulnerable.page. The page would respond by setting a session identifier, um, something to indicate that Bob has an active session, keep track, keeping track of the actions that he's doing on the site, um, things like that. And then Bob will then browse over to his favorite site that's hosting his unicorn video. And on that site, we would see some malicious JavaScript that submits a post request to um, his company site in this case, or this, the vulnerable CSERF site. Now, Bob's browser uh, would interpret that request and then submit the request to the company site. Um, and that would be using Bob's browser, it would be using Bob's session, and so everything would be presented as it was Bob making that request to the site. Now, in this case, those requests didn't work because I was using JavaScript and those um, Newer versions of the browsers are stopping that. If you had done it as just a form, um, just like an HTML form where they have to click a button or something like that, it wouldn't have been any problem. Um, browsers don't stop those, those types of requests. So CSERP has been around um, for a long time with a really notable attack a couple years ago known as the goat worm on Twitter. And it was known as the goat worm uh, because user started, a user started it, posted a link, or tweeted a link, and all of his followers that clicked the link would then tweet out a request that said, um, I like to perform sexually explicit acts with goats, WTF, and then the link as well. And so the worm multiplied and spread. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, so the worm multiplied and spread and started with one tweet, and then all of that, users, followers, or well, many of them, maybe not all of them, clicked the tweet. And when they clicked the link, they then tweeted the link out as well. And it went out to all of their followers. And it just kept spreading and propagating and ended up affecting thousands and thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of users from the first couple days. So CSERF um, can, can be really harmful or it can be funny, you know, submitting or sending tweets about goats is kind of funny, not particularly detrimental. Um, it could be more harmful in cases. I, there's one case that, or in some of the pen tests we've done, um, one of the other analysts I work with found an instance where he could check other people's kids out of daycare uh, by exploiting a CSERF attack. Um, I found CSERF attacks that may be a little more financially damaging where you know, if somebody would visit my page or click on my link or whatever would trigger the attack, they would order cheesy bread, or they visited my page, if they were logged into a pizza company, they would order um, pizza and cheesy bread and Mountain Dew and deliver it to my house. And so in that case, I benefited. They were out a couple bucks um, for pizza and Mountain Dew. And the company would get egg on their face because their customers were being attacked and they weren't being protected. And CSERF um, had been on the OWASP top 10 for a long time. It first appeared in 2007. Um, it was initially discussed in an OWASP meeting in 2006, but the attack vector itself has been known since at least 2001. There was a white paper published back then talking about session writing, which is another name for cross-site request forgery. And so with, so I, yeah, OWASP decided to add it to the top 10 in 2007, and it maintained its spot on the OWASP top 10 until this most recent release in 2017. 2017, um, it was merged or retired, but it was not forgotten. Uh, OWASP said that less than 5% of applications that were, or less than 5% of applications had CSERF identified um, as an attack vector. Personally, um, I think the, the number is a lot higher. But OWASP takes the entire industry into account, and so everybody's going to have different opinions. It could just be that my sites I come across um, 
haven't come around to fixing it yet. I tend, I tend to see it closer to 50% of the time. Like half the sites that I test end up being vulnerable to cross-site request forgery in some way, shape, or form. Some instances, um, they think they fixed cross-site request forgery on a previous pen test that somebody did, but they didn't actually take the, take the steps to prevent it. They just hit it or, or masked it. So I'm going to look at some of the ways that um, you can protect yourself from CSERF. Obviously, if you're using the newest, most current browsers, they're going to provide a little bit of protection um, and interrupt your demos. Now, a really common way, um, mo probably the most popular way to protect yourself from cross-site request forgery is to use what's called the synchronizer token. And that's when you just stick a really large random value into the request, um, typically into the body of the request. In this instance, um, we would have seen on the example is the developers just added a really large um, SHA-256 value as a parameter in the post body for, for any request that changes state in the application. And so any request that Bob makes after or on the site includes that request. And that interrupts attackers um, because it's a large random value which the attacker doesn't know about. So if they try and submit a request that should change the name like they did before with name equals CSERF, it gets rejected. The site checks and says that the CSERF token isn't there. And we can see that's what, or so if the attacker then changed to try and adapt to what the site has done and they start including the CSERF token in their request that they're making, um, it's gonna check to see if the site is actually validating the token, or if it's just looking for the CISO surf token parameter to exist. Believe it or not, um, that's a common mistake that a lot of sites have made. They'll check to see that a CSERF token parameter, whatever they call it, is present in the request, but they don't actually check that the value of the token is, what's, is what they're expecting. So in the demonstration, the attacker would have submitted fake is the value of the CSERF token, and it would have succeeded because the site didn't actually validate it. So if they'd fix it and actually validate that the token matches the token that they're expecting, and they would have protected themselves. Another option to protect yourself um, from CSERF attacks is to require active interaction from the user. And that's typically requiring the user to either re-enter their password before they're making a change, or doing something substantial like making a purchase, or to require them to answer a CAPTCHA or something along those lines. Um, you see the required password a lot on password reset forms. Um, that tends to be a popular one where users have to enter their old password in order to change to a new password. Um, Amazon has started requ or requesting your password as you're proceeding through the checkout function just to make sure that you're actually intending to make the, the function. Uh, but the idea being that requiring their password, it's supposed to verify that that's the user and the user actually intends to make the request. The attacker already knows the user's password. They don't need to use CSERP to attack the site. They can just log in as the user and perform the actions on their own. So um, it seemed to be that there was it was kind of a switch over in mindset a couple years ago. I don't know if there was a new batch of developers uh, coming out of college or just new fancy technology that was coming out and everybody was excited about it. Um, but a lot of applications on the internet started moving towards single page applications um, using Angular, Node, Sales, Express, things like that. And the sites that were created were, were beautiful. They were, they were dynamic. They were, had a clean, modern feel. Um, they were a lot more pleasant for users to interact with. And it was about that same time when there was that switch. A lot of people, or a lot of sites started uh, reintroducing or becoming vulnerable um, to cross-site request forgery again. The reason being um, is that single-page applications, as they tend to, to pass information back and forth using AJAX, um, making request passing JSON um, with content type of application JSON. So when a user 
or if an attacker were to try and mimic that behavior and submit a request, um, the head, yeah, the head of content type of application JSON that would trigger the in-browser protections, like we saw when I was trying to do the demos earlier. Um, it blocked those requests. A lot of those requests, um, if you're trying to submit requests like that, um, if you're if you submit a request using application JSON as content type, it'll trigger an options request. Um, the demos had worked. We've had a, a burp log running of the requests as they were being sent, and we would have seen that when Bob visited the malicious site, instead of sending a post request, um, it would have sent an options request. That options request is a, a result of the core specification that came out a few years ago. Uh, if you were in, this talk, in the talk that took place just before this, um, cores came up briefly. It stands for cross-origin resource sharing. It's a specification that dictates how websites can communicate with each other, how they can share information, what resources one site is, is allowed to access from another site, um, and things of that nature. And part of the course specification um, that say, states that non-simple requests require a course pre-flight. And that's what that options request is. It's a pre-flight requ pre request to satisfy the course specification, just to make sure that what the site is requesting is actually allowed by um, the site that it's requesting it from. And we're, we're gonna talk about cores just briefly um, specifically about simple requests. The reason being is that simple requests are it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's a small, very limited subset of all possible requests that are considered simple. Um, it's requests that are get, that are, that are either get method, post method, or that use a, well, it's a post method that uses a basic HTML form, essentially. Um, or what could be submitted in a basic HTML form. Whereas all the other possible requests that are out there uh, are really large, and so talking about each and every one of those, trying to define a request as non-simple, um, a much bigger pie to tackle. So simple requests, um, so they're get, post, or head. And they allow simple headers. Um, you can normally see those headers just in your normal everyday browsing using the internet. Um, with specific con three specific content types that are allowed. The three that are allowed if you're using a form element. Um, those being text plane, multi-part form data, or application XWW form URL encoded. So it's a pretty, pretty small subset of all possible requests are considered simple. And so with the evolution into single page applications and everybody moving to using application JSON as the content type, a lot of requests have no longer fallen into the, the simple category. Uh, the requests that require a course pre-flight and therefore a lot of browsers are blocking those requests. And then in the pre-flight, all it is is um, it'll send an options, and the, or the origin site will send an options and ask with the access control request, and then it'll list off a couple of the things that it wants, uh, or the special things that make the request non-simple, see if they're acceptable by the other site. So the problem with that is that cores is not a security specification. Um, they explicitly say in the core specification that it's not a security specification, that all normal uh, protections should be in place, especially protections related to cross-site request forgery, because any protection that occurs because of cores being implemented on a browser um, is incidental. They're not, they weren't trying to, to secure anything when they defined, when they came up with a specification. So um, one of the common things that I've seen that catches people that are relying on cores um, as their method of protection is they think that you know, we're doing AJAX requests, 
It's um, application JSON for everything that's in use on our site. And so we're safe, we're protected. Um, you know, cores will, will protect us. But then we run into a problem that if we submit a request that uses text plain, it still passes the body at, in what appears to be a JSON object. A lot of times the sites will validate it or accept it. They're trying to be more, more lenient or forgiving to requests coming in. And so they make it so text plain is acceptable. And they just parse the JSON, JSON on the back end. Um, text plain is considered simple. Um, no matter what the body actually looks like, your browser is just going to treat it as, as text, just raw text being, saying, uh, being sent. So even if your entire site is communicating um, with AJAX and you're passing JSON back and forth, if you accept requests that are text plain, you could be vulnerable to cross-site request forgery. Um, and there's even an even more drastic or involved way to bypass um, the cores as well. Let's see if this one will actually work. So let's see. We've still got Bob. He's still out at lunch. So Bob comes back and checks out his new favorite video, Neon Cat. It's going to go on for 10 hours. And that one didn't work either. So not entirely sure why that one didn't work, but we'll take a look at what is supposed to happen. So if we go back to our scenario with Bob, where we left him off, Bob would log into the application. Um, the application would set the cookie. Actually, let me see if I can jump ahead to that. So uh, we'll just walk through it in the slideshow, not actually have a working demonstration. Um, but another way that attackers can bypass um, the cores uh, to perform a cross-site request forgery attack. So Bob logs into the application, um, gets a, an active session, and then goes to visit his favorite site um, that's hosting the videos he likes to watch while he's at lunch. And then embedded on that site, we can either have a more verbose or visible um, script that just creates a, an object on the page, um, which is a flash object, and we pass a couple of parameters to that flash object, or um, we can base64 encode the object and just include it in an iframe, um, which is a much easier way to obfuscate the attack. So if somebody were to look at the source, they'd probably just see blobs of code, and most people wouldn't care that there's a base64 encoded um, object included on the page. And then how the attack works is Bob's browser would then visit the, the vulnerable um, or the malicious flash page. And when it visits the mis malicious flash page, it passes in those parameters. Um, first parameter being the API or the endpoint that we're actually targeting on the vulnerable site, um, the request method that we're going to use, post, the content type the request should be, which is application JSON, and then the actual um, data that we're submitting to the page. And finally, um, we're going to pass in a redirect page, uh, just a PHP redirect page. And so the flash object is going to then submit a request to the redirect page um, with all 
or using those parameters that are passed to it to construct a request. And so the endpoint that's gonna be passed to the redirect page um, is, or, yeah, is the endpoint on the vulnerable site. Um, and then the request that's sent to the redirect page is passing with content type of application JSON um, with the, the actual JSON da data and the body. And then our redirect page, which is literally one line of PHP that just um, performs a 307 redirect. Um, we'll take all those, take the information that came into it with the post request and just submit it to the new location. And so we end up with a post to the vulnerable page um, that looks like it came from, from Bob's browser uh, with the actual, or with the body to change the, to change Bob's name and it's using Bob's session. So um, a couple things went on in that attack that you didn't actually get to, to see that I had to walk, or that I walked you through. Um, so why was Flash used? Flash came out um, with a cross-domain policy um, several years before the cores policy came about. Um, so they, Flash doesn't respect cores, core specification. Um, they don't adhere to it, they just kind of do their own thing. And then we use a 307 redirect instead of a 302 because 302 redirects um, ignore the method that was used. If you redirect a post with a 302, it'll tend to do a get. Whereas the 307 will honor everything about the request that came in. So we submitted a post with a specific content type and body to a 307 and the 307 keeps the request um, as it originally appeared and just redirects it to a new host. So, um, well, it may seem that there's always ways to potentially get around um, CSERF protections that are out there. Um, the active and passive protections do work with an asterisk next to passive protections because if cross-site scripting ex exists on the site, um, then passive protections won't work. Um, Cross-site scripting can be used if you're including um, a token in the request. You can grab that token with JavaScript and just bypass the, the cross-site request forgery protections. Um, I actually performed an attack like that on a client just a couple days ago where they had um, process, or they had their CSERF token, token included in all the requests. It was large, it was random, to protect them, but they had cross-site scripting on a couple of their pages, um, and their CSERF token was valid for the entire session. Um, and that, it didn't change, so if I got it once, then I could perform any attack, or perform any request as if I was that user using their, um, their CSERF token. So keep that in mind when you're trying to protect, if you're trying to protect yourself from um, cross-site request forgery. So some final thoughts. Um, every state changing request should be protected from cross-site request forgery. Um, whether it be logging in, changing the username, changing your password, uh, transferring money, whatever is going on on the site. Um, if it's changing the state of the application, it should be protected. And you can either protect, protect it with either active or passive measures. Um, don't rely on CSERF protection, well, no. If your framework is using, includes some form of CSERF protection, make sure that it's actually enabled and working. Um, I've come across several clients or customers that you know, I'll report cross-site request forgery on their, on their penetration test and they'll come back and say, our framework says it, it implements cross-site request forgery. Why isn't it working? I was like, well, none of your requests included a cross-site request forgery token or any sort of random data per, to prevent the attack. Are you guys sure that you enabled it? A lot of times it's as simple as they didn't go into a config file and put CSERF equals true or CSERF protection equals true or whatever the framework had them do. Um, So if you want any more information, um, there's some of the resources that I used. Um, this SWF, JSON CSERF, um, they have a really useful tool to craft 
C surf attacks using Flash. So sorry, none of the, none of the demonstrations work, so you can see all that cool stuff. Um, but good news is you get out of here a few minutes early for lunch. So there you go.